How you guys doing today? That was not rhetorical. I really want an answer. I'm still waking up, so. <laughs> uh, all right, so first and foremost, I want to apologize. <clears throat> I had uh, to come over, and I had a little bit of a layover in the UK. And usually I have lots of toys up here for this talk, but uh, the UK didn't like the fact that I was traveling with a miniature Predator drone. So they sent it back to the States. So I've got pictures and some movies and stuff as we go through this. Unfortunately, I don't have my big radio-controlled airplane with me. So um, well, we'll get a little bit started here. So uh, first and foremost, uh, the talk's going to be a little bit about how to use like everyday items, um, some toys, things like that, to break through physical security, technical security, things like that. Uh, should be a little, it should be fun. Uh, do a little bit of uh, history lesson included. Uh, we're going to do some background on James Bond in particular, just because I think James Bond's cool as hell. Uh, and uh, then we're going to actually go into the history a little bit about uh, some of the espionage techniques and things like that that we'll actually talk about. Uh, actually figure out why James Bond is so cool, which is a rhetorical question. But, uh, and then uh, we're going to go through uh, some of the toys and stuff like that and uh, the ease of access and the ability to get a hold of the stuff. And uh, then we're actually going to do a hacking demo, and then we're going to do a live demo. Um, I've got my phone up here. So uh, earlier this year, I released a, uh, a version of Ubuntu that runs on smartphones that's pen test specific. So it's got a lot of built-in tools similar to like Backtrack. I actually released before Backtrack did. So, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll have some fun. So a little bit about me. Uh, I am a pen tester at Rapid7. I've been doing this for about eight years. I uh, started my own security company, well, IT company while I was still in high school. Uh, so I've been in the industry for a long time. Um, this is my like 14th conference that I've talked at already this year, so I've been doing a lot of these. Uh, this is particular, this is the, only the second time that I've done this talk, so it should be fun. It's a lot more fun when I have gadgets, but. Uh, so James Bond, a little bit, uh, obviously 007. Uh, fictional crea character created in 1953 uh, by Ian Fleming. Uh, I'm sure most of you guys have at least seen one James Bond movie or read a novel or something throughout your lives. Um, yeah, uh, if you notice, he never ages. Like Ian Fleming made it in the stories that he, he will never age. Uh, they say his birth date was roughly 1921, in 1921-ish. So it depends on which book you actually go by. A uh, little bit more history. So uh, son of Andrew Bond. And uh, so he's uh, a good, you know, UK resident and uh, was uh, 11 when uh, his parents actually uh, were killed in a mountain climbing accident. As fun as I guess that is. Uh, I've never been mountain climbing, so. Uh, Bond Family Model uh, is actually one of the names of the films. So uh, it's just kind of cool, fun little facts that you guys can play with later. Something that you might get at some bar trivia somewhere. Uh, so, and then to go into a little bit about the real stuff. So, obviously, you see a lot of things that come up in movies and a lot of things that, uh, you know, look fant uh, fant like fantasy or fiction, things like that. But a lot of the stuff is actually being used out there. Um, not only does the movies take stuff from re real life, but uh, real life takes things from movies a lot of times. So, uh, first and foremost, every, every good spy needs to know about the dead drop. Uh, basically, it's the act of you know hiding something where someone else can retrieve it uh, with without you know alerting anyone else or having anyone else uh, notice it. They uh, the, the Russians actually accused Britain of using a radio uh, drop uh, dead drop. What they did was they actually built a radio transmitter into a fake rock. So if you if, if you're familiar with like the key hides that you can put your rocks in, or put the key in. It looks like a rock and throw it in your front lawn and nobody notice it. Well, the, the Brits actually decided to put a radio transmitter and receiver in there so that they would, uh, somebody would be able to walk by with just a uh, transmitter, put the information into the rock, and then somebody could come by later and pick it up. Uh, and, and no longer did they necessitate the ability to actually walk over and pick anything up physically. You could simply walk by, look like you're on your phone, and uh, grab the information that way. So, um, yeah. Bugs, uh, obviously, for wiretapping, things like that, uh, still used uh, pretty much for surveillance in everyday life. 
Um, in particular, in 2003, uh, the US FBI decided that they uh, wanted access to everybody's car systems. So they actually went after your in-car GPS, uh, OnStar systems and things like that, and, and we're using it for a little bit of time for uh, surveillance on people without anybody knowing. Uh, there was, they actually turned that over and uh, said that they couldn't do it because it was actually disabling the security function of it. So no, if, you, if they were actually listening to you and you got into a car accident or whatever, the guys that we're supposed to call weren't able to actually send an ambulance. So they decided that that was bad. <laughs> and uh, and they, they reversed that so they can no longer do it, so they say. Um, and then uh, today with the ability and use of smartphones and everything like that, uh, using some of your Android root kits and things like that, you can actually turn those on for monitoring devices, recording devices, phone, or for video, whatever you need. And it's a nice way to uh, be undetected when you're actually connecting to someone and listening to whatever their conversation is and things like that. Steganography, I'm sure a good number of you guys know what that is. Um, the first time that it was actually uh, referred to as steganography was in 1499. And um, because it was, again, he was trying to, again to hide it, the author actually put it in a book that was uh, listed under a magic. So uh, it was, uh, it was uh, even the book about steganography was hidden, uh, which I thought was kind of funny. And then surveillance. Obviously, this, this is a big thing, no matter whether it's electronic with bugs or uh, video or person, human int type stuff. Uh, this stuff is always uh, a huge thing for uh, organizations, whether it's going to be somebody that's trying to do some social engineering physically or whether it's uh, a government trying to watch somebody in particular. So some of the different kinds of uh, surveillance, spying, if you will, uh, is obviously your computers, your telephones, social media, things like that. Uh, it could be even just somebody sitting, watching, and uh, performing human int operations. Uh, global positioning, if they want to listen, look and find out where your, um, you know, your Garmin device is or your phone or whatever that you're carrying on you. Uh, it, it makes it very easy today with the, the connections and everything that everybody has with them every day. So. Why, what makes James Bond so cool? So this is, this is where we start to have, actually have a little bit of fun. So well, who wants to start, uh, yell out some answers? Why is James Bond so cool? There you go. Yes, very good. He is, he is the brains behind the... He's always full of gas. He's always full of gas. <laughs> yeah, he never runs out of gas. Anybody else? Come on. There you go. <laughs> See, now, now we're starting to think. All right. So, uh, you know, I mean, obviously every time that he's wearing his tux, he, uh, uh, why are we, uh, there we go. It, it's, it's never wrinkled, uh, if you ever notice. Doesn't matter whether he's getting out of the water, doesn't matter, whatever. <laughs> he just has this magical tux that he always looks, you know, just definitely distinguished in. But, uh, I, 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 you know, as cool as that is, it's still, you know. How about the love of martinis? Come on, everybody loves a good drink. I know I had a few last night, so. <laughs> A couple other guys were with me for those. It wasn't just me. So, um, and uh, obviously, it has to be the women, right? So uh, it, James Bond always has beautiful women around him at all points in time. Got a lot of them. So yeah, I just I really did just do a slide montage of women. So. <laughs> But, uh, but really, you know, it's, it's what everybody's here to talk about. Uh, what really makes Bond so cool, it's, it's all the toys and stuff that he actually gets to play with. So uh, when, I, when I was actually doing this, uh, I, I started playing with a lot of everyday stuff and really wanted to have some of the really cool toys. So I, I started looking at what's available out there that you can actually just go on the internet and order and, uh, and pretend to be James Bond. So first thing was, you know, to take a look at what were the, the key, uh, like, Bond toys that were, uh, you know, the ones that I really wanted. And obviously, you know, the, the first one that, that I thought about was uh, the jetpack. Now, I'm sure that everybody here has at least seen Rocket Man, you know, the, the, the guy that flies around. And I looked at that, and it's like 350 grand for one of those. So I was like, that's just not feasible. So uh, I started looking a little bit further, and uh, I'm going to cut out here. 
because the video that I put in there isn't as great. And I, and I actually found something pretty awesome. And if this loads up without issue here. Uh, let's give me one second here. Where is... <laughs> That's not it. All right, we'll, we'll, do the, we'll do the shitty video, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I started looking, and I was like, well, you know, it would be really awesome if I, if I could find someone that actually had one of these things that you could actually fly around with. And I said, sorry about the shitty conversion, but... Yeah, it is water, by the way. So, so yeah, there, there was a, a couple of guys that actually decided to make a, a jetpack out of fire hoses, essentially. So, uh, unfortunately, they only made 70 of these things, and they're already sold out. Uh, I tried to get on the waiting list, but... Uh, but I, I was like, you know, this would be absolutely awesome. I don't care who's got the best wave runner out there. Nothing beats the jetpack. I mean, come on. So, uh, this, it's an awesome video. I, I, obviously, I don't work for any of these companies, so it, it's not a promo video of any sort, but uh, it, it was one of those things that I just thought that, you know, if you're going to have one, uh, going to be James Bond, you got to have some kind of a jet pack. So, this thing actually flies at like 35 feet off the water. Um, it's that, the big black hose on the back is what's actually pumping it, and there's like this little wave runner thing that follows. So, it's, it's limited to water, but... You can actually, you know, become a submarine or whatever you want. Uh, yeah, it, it, I just, I was like, this is an awesome toy. So, uh, all right, if anybody wants to watch the rest of the video, you can check it out on YouTube. It's called Jet Live. Um, they, 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 uh, they sell for about 100 grand, which is, you know, a third of the cost of the, the other one. But... Uh, but yeah, I, was, I, I thought, all right, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna be James Bond, you, you seriously got to have one of these toys, because without it, it, it's just not the same. So uh, I, I'll quit the video because it's kind of choppy. But uh, so then I, and then I you know, uh, I, you know, I was thinking, okay, well. You know, I, I want, you know, something that I could actually, uh, you know, play with and maybe see if I can get some more information, intelligent stuff. So, uh, I actually, if it, I really wish it was here, but I decided to build a remote control airplane. So, I, I've, do, I've been doing RC stuff for a lot, and inside here, uh, it actually has, an, uh, if, you, if anybody was at uh, DEF CON, they had uh, one of the guys out there with one of the UAVs that had uh, the 802.11 stuff in there. Well, I added the 802.11 stuff. Um, I've actually got one of these phones in there, uh, which supports GSM as well as GPS and everything else. So it actually sends me back its uh, altitude and everything uh, wirelessly. And uh, actually put in an autopilot and a, a GPS, um, uh, basically an open source kind of actual UAV controls to this. And I bought the model for about 200 bucks online. So it, this isn't even like something that, you know, you got to go out and spend a huge, and it even came with the remote control. I upgraded that, obviously, but. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a cool little toy. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, uh, they didn't really like the fact that I had this with me. So yeah, that's the camera that's mounted on front. So the, the camera is actually controlled uh, by servo on there uh, from, a, uh, from another channel that's on the radio so that you can rotate the uh, uh, camera 360 degrees just like on the real one. Uh, it's also got, like I said, the GPS and everything. So for like two, 300 bucks, including all the, uh, the GPS, the autopilot, everything else, I was actually have my, able to have myself a Predator drone. Unfortunately, it wasn't one of the uh, ones that fired anything, but it was still pretty cool. So 
Um, I actually use this uh, during a physical social engineering engagement and uh, did a video which was pretty similar to this because they had security guards and stuff that, uh, and they had a fenced in um, physical perimeter. And if, even if you were actually using this against uh, some, you know, for testing purposes only, uh, some of the larger organizations, um, it's got such a small cross section that it's not even gonna really show up other than like a bird. So, plus it's all made out of like uh, foam and balsa wood. So you're, you're not gonna, it's not really gonna be picked up too well other than the sound of an electric motor. Uh, the, uh, the flight time is dependent upon the battery that you actually put in. It's all run off of electric. Uh, there's no gas or anything like that that you have to worry about. Uh, they come in, uh, you can get either ducted fan or you can have just an actual prop on there. So, but yeah, you know, so I was like, yeah, this is, this is a pretty cool thing. Uh, it actually stands about this tall and the wings are about as wide as my arm span. So, and it floats, like this thing can stay up in the air pro for probably about uh, four hours on a single charge. Just because if you set it up where it, it'll actually glide and actually have a little bit of a drop in the altitude, it'll then only fire the engine up when you, it actually has to gain lift. So it's a pretty cool little toy, you know. But I was like, all right, this stuff's fun, this stuff's cool, but there's gotta be something better. You know, what, what's that next, that even better, you know, Bond toy thing that really makes him, uh, you know, James Bond. And uh, my thought was, it's got to be the car, right? You know, uh, what about, you know, the, the ability to go underwater in your car? And there, there's always been some weird, you know, crazy person that decided to make a car that went underwater, but none of them were really cool enough to be considered Bond's car. So I, I did a little bit of research and uh, decided that I, you know, if I was gonna do it, I needed to do it right. So I found this, and this is actually their video, I, but, um, and is there, there's an app for this, by the way. So yes, he's actually controlling his car by his phone. Uh, it's got a uh, camera on the front, uh, some lasers that actually reads the road in front of him and such. And it's kind of got that cool, you know, sports car-y look kind of like a, one of the Teslas. So I was like, all right, this is pretty cool. I'm, I'm, I'm all right with this. So I, I, I did some more research and such, and this, this thing actually is sports, it's, it's got sports car speed and everything else. So I was like, all right, this, this could be Bond's car. But let's see if this thing actually performs uh, underwater. Yeah, yeah. It's got uh, two built-in oxygen tanks, so uh, <laughs> so it, uh, it's um, everything in it is all electric. It's all zero emissions. So for your green people out there, that you know, you can you can be James Bond and be green at the same time. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's actually got a top speed of like 120 miles an hour, 140 miles an hour, right in between there, depending on who you ask. Um, <laughs> and uh, it actually performed pretty well. And just like James Bond, as we get a little bit towards here, somehow this guy's tux again is dry. I know. And he's drinking a martini. <laughs> um, yeah, as far as I know, they, they've only produced like five of them. So I don't know if they're going to actually move these into a production or if, they're, if, you have, if it's like one of those things where you have the money, you can have one. So uh, again, I'm trying to find that waiting list. If anybody knows of anybody from... Uh, Do you have uh, any discount codes for us? <laughs> <laughs> but like, like I said, there is an app for it. So depending on, depending on the security of the app, you might get one for free. Uh, so, you know, basically with all those tools, I was I, I like, all right, so I can bypass a lot of the physical security. I can, you know, I can get away. I can drive into the water and get away, you know, but, you know, those were still eh, semi-unfeasible for purchasing and a little bit out of my budget and uh, really couldn't get my employer to back any of the jetpacks or anything, so. So, you know, then I decided to look at some of the smaller stuff. 
Uh, there's obviously you have your spy pen, and uh, yeah, every every good spy has got to have a way to you know watch what's going on, record video, audio, things like that. So I found this one online. It's uh, it's actually got a USB uh, connector on the bottom of it, and uh, you can record uh, about uh, I think I think it's like 37 minutes, 30 some minutes of uh, film on here internally. And uh, again, I mean, you're talking minuscule. And these things sell for 30 bucks online. So I was like, all right, cool. Now, now, now I can record everything that I'm doing after I get in on my jetpack. And uh, you know, started looking at the phone. Obviously, we just saw that you can control your phone, or c control your submersible car with your phone. Just like uh, James did in, in uh, which was it, Tomorrow Never Dies, I think it was. Uh, and uh, 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 quit. And then, of course, you had uh, what is it, Quantum of Solace, where he had the hidden uh, camera in his phone and things like that. Nowadays, everybody knows that there's cameras on your phone. Uh, had some satellite imaging and things like that that you could do with it. So I was like, all right, well, does it actually have anything to do with InfoSec? And, uh, you know, as much as it's cool, you know, as cool as it is to be James Bond, if you're not able to really do anything uh, other than, you know, just gain the intelligence because you're obviously, you don't have a license to kill, <laughs> um, <laughs> then, uh, you know, what's the deal? So what I did was I actually put together the WMD project, which is, again, a uh, full pen testing distribution of Ubuntu uh, made for smartphones. So uh, the one that I'm, I actually have sitting up here is uh, the old Rhodium. Uh, it's online, you can get it for about 60, 70 bucks US. And uh, you can have a full distribution of Ubuntu running. Uh, it's got Metasploit built in, it's got, uh, I wish you would stop doing that. Social Engineers Toolkit built in, and Map, uh, a whole lot of utilities all pre-built into it. Uh, you, it's open source, so you can freely download everything. Everything's available online. Uh, and then the newest version actually runs on Android as well. Thanks to the market, you can actually go on and download Android Linux installer, and you can now push button install Linux or Ubuntu or Debian onto your phone. So moving forward, uh, I no longer actually had to prepackage a lot of this stuff, so now the latest revision of the WMD package is an install script. So uh, everything runs uh, from an installer script, and you get a full distribution of Ubuntu on there. And uh, in particular, even if you do use one of the older ones, you still get Bluetooth, you still get GPS, you still get 3G service. Uh, you can actually use your phone while you're also in the Ubuntu environment, get your text messages and everything, import your contacts, things like that. So you can actually stay connected while you need to do it. So uh, I, I actually said you know, at the beginning that we're going to do some live hacking. So let's bring this demo up here. And what I have, if it'll, there we go, is I have a VNC session actually set up to my phone right here. So this is the phone sitting on the, the stage. If anybody want to watch the one, go walk up or whatever, you guys can come see it. But uh, it, it works just like any other Ubuntu build. So you get your full information, you've got full script, you've got apt inst installed, you've got everything that's running in the background. So what I did was I actually took a couple of uh, Windows VMs here, I'm just showing them. They're actually on my screen if you don't believe. But. And uh, what we're going to do is we're actually going to run Metasploit from the phone against these VMs. So uh, like any good cooking show, let me take Metasploit out of the oven here. Oh, that's VMC. Ah, there we go. So we've got, we've got framework set up here. And uh, because I'm doing it over VNC, you kind of got to bear with me here. Uh, the clipboard and stuff isn't the greatest, but. So if uh, first things first, that most uh, times that you're going to do is you're obviously going to run an NMAP scan. Um, I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm going to actually run this, but uh, I'm not. I, I know what I'm, the IP is I'm going against, so I'm, like I said, I'm cheating a little bit. But 
We'll do one, uh, we'll do a scan again. It's 192, 168. It's 73. So, Again, like I said, I know, I know the IP address that I'm looking at, so it's for demo purposes. Normally, if you're going to run this, you're going to run this against, uh, you know, your network or whatever. And uh, so there we've got some, we've got some inter interesting information. So we've obviously got a Windows machine running. And uh, what's, what's like the number one go-to Metasploit package if you're going to try to get something to run on a Windows machine? Anybody? MSO8067, anybody know that one? Come on. Uh, so... Uh, MSO 067, uh, if you're unfamiliar, uh, was kind of made famous by the configure worm uh, that had a nasty little f spread. And So if I go ahead and paste this in here. So we're, we're going to set this exploit here. Uh, everybody here is at least familiar with Metasploit somewhat? Yes? No? Yes? Yes? No? Yes? yes. There, there you go. Answer. Yes. Uh, so we're going to use uh, the MS08 exploit. We're going to use uh, set our payload here. So we're going we're gonna to use a uh, bind payload. We're going to use uh, bind TCP, and we're going to try to set up a interpreter session. Um, if anybody's unfamiliar with interpreter, it's a really nice uh, utility that you can, it'll basically run in RAM. Use it for all your connections, runs lots of fun little tools and things like that. So if we do uh, show options, we're going to see what we're able to set. So again, now I know what machine that we want to go after from doing our Nmap scan here. So we, we want to go after this uh, .73 machine, right? See if we get anything on there. So if we do, we set our, our host, which is going to be our target, to that 73 address. Happens a little faster on the phone here, so. Uh, and then we're we already know that we're going to um, use that same port. Obviously, we're going to connect over 443 things like that. And uh, because we're using a bind, we don't actually have to set our local address. So if everything works, we should be able to run exploit and actually have this thing connect. So while this is running. Um, uh, this can be, perf you, uh, I've actually used this at a, as a proof of concept for one of my clients uh, when I first released this. And uh, a couple of years ago, I got some more inspiration from one of the f uh, f uh, previous DEF CON talks. And what he did was they basically sent a iPhone in with a battery uh, backup and uh, was able to get access. So I was like, all right, cool. So what I did was I actually put the, my phone into a box, had a battery uh, backup on there, and mailed it to my client. Because the previous day while I was doing my walk around for their physical engagement, uh, I found out that they still had WEP deployed uh, within their uh, in, uh, loading dock. And in their loading dock, the reason that I found out afterwards was because their scanners were so bad. They're so, so old that they only supported WEP. So cracked that, pre-populated the uh, information into the phone, mailed that out, and mailed it on a uh, Thursday, uh, overnighted it with UPS so that it would sit there on Friday, and mailed it to myself. Now, obviously, I didn't work there. Nobody else knew that I was sending it to myself. So what are they going to do? It's going to sit there until they figure out that I don't actually work there. 
So it sat in their loading dock for about 18 hours while I connected to it, sitting in my lazy boy, in my boxers, playing Call of Duty, running Metasploit packages against their server environment because their scanners were connected to their inventory control system, which was in their server environment. So uh, I was actually able to start doing uh, some of the, or running some of the utilities and such uh, right, from the, uh, right from my lazy boy sitting at home. And if we get the Meterpreter console set up here, we, got the, we already got the session, so I'm just, there we go. So first thing that we're going to do is we're going to run hash dump. Everybody familiar with that script? Yeah. All right. So we're going to use that, and we're going to actually dump those local hashes for the, hopefully the, an administrator account. Now, one thing that I found in a lot of the pen tests that I've done uh, was that uh, there, a lot of organizations use a standard local administrator. Uh, where we got? Let's try that again. So uh, what I found is a lot of organizations use a standard build because it cuts down on the amount of time and effort and money and things like that that uh, uh, organizations have to spend on their uh, on putting out machines. And when they do that, generally they have a shared local administrator account. So there you can see our, we've got our administrator account, our Windows 500 account here. And here's our hash. Now, anybody here familiar with pass the hash? Yes? All right. So what, we're, what I've got is I've actually got a second uh, VM set up. And we're, we're going to see if we can do this. So on a normal engagement, what I'll do is I'll try, if I can get access to one of these, I'll take the module, uh, the, we can exit out of this. And if I use the PS exec module to, in Metasploit, one step ahead of me. If I use the PS exec module, uh, this one, no. Too many X's. Is it? Okay. Um, so if we, if we use this and we actually do the show options, we can see everything that we need to set here. And you can actually use this against uh, a single host. If you use some of the newer uh, Metasploit ones, like uh, Metasploit Community and some of the other free versions with the GUI uh, that uh, Rapid7 just released, you can run this against uh, CIDR. Uh, ranges, you can run this against multiple uh, network segments, things like that. So you can actually uh, run this utility through a whole lot of different machines. So if we set our, if we set our hash, or excuse me, our password, so we're going to set our SMB pass. to that hash that we were able to get right here. Come on, there we go. Stop moving. So if we, t if we take this hash that we just grabbed uh, off of the uh, one host and we paste that down to the one below, if we scroll down. There, there we go. So we'll set that, and then we're going to set our uh, SMB user as administrator. Helps if you hit enter. And then we're going to set our user to administrator here, if it refreshes itself. And uh, now, normally, if, again, if you would have run Nmap and doing your discovery, you would have known that there was more machines out there. But again, I'm going to cheat here. So uh, we have a second target that I set up.
And if, if you don't believe me, I can show you. So we have target two here, which is again secured. Oh, we've, well, we've got a username and password on there, so it's secure, right? Username and password secure everything. And if we do a show options again, we'll, we'll actually see that the hash was populated into the SMB password section and the uh, administrator username is set up in the SMB user. So if we do a set our host for our other machine, which in this case is going to be a 192.168.1.136 address, and if everything works because we did we used again a, a standard build, then uh, we should be able to get another interpreter session. Oh, helps if I set a payload. That might help. So again, we're going to use Meterpreter here. Um, I, I use Meterpreter every time that I possibly can just because it's, it's a really good utility. You've got a lot of uh, scripts and things like that that you can natively use. And if everything works properly, we should be able to get a connection on that second machine. So all we're doing is we're, we're taking, we, you no longer have to, if you're unfamiliar with pass to hash, you no longer actually have to crack passwords anymore. So as long as you get access to that hash, thank you to Windows for making PSExec available. Um, we can actually do a pass the hash using one of the Microsoft utilities. Uh, and if it all works, you should be able to get a session with, uh, with just that hash. So it's uh, the refresh rate on the VNC session is a little bit slow. Uh, later on, if anybody wants to play with the phone, test it out, see what it does, you know, kind of muck around with it, you're more than welcome to. Just find me somewhere. Otherwise, you can, again, you can download the stuff online. So if this thing refreshes sometime soon. It's thinking. There we go. So we, we just uh, ended up setting up the connection to uh, that secondary machine using that uh, password hash. It's uh, generating its service account, and we should have a interpreter session coming up here in just a second. And again, this is, this is all running off of a phone. So anywhere that, uh, I, I've used this also for other social engineering engagements where uh, if you can actually gain access and you plug this thing into the wall, you have power for as long as the building has power. Uh, you, put a, you don't need to use a SIM card in there if you, if you don't want to. You can still use the wireless connection on there. But if you use the SIM card, then you have 3G access. And there we've got our interpreter session. So uh, again, you can do this across an entire domain. You can do this across uh, multiple machines. Any of the normal scripts, services, things like that that are built in the Metasploit framework are available here. You can, run up, uh, you can actually run Social Engineers Toolkit to uh, do some web, uh, actual, uh, web hacking and things like that uh, because Apache is built in as well. So uh, you can also do some of the uh, SMS attacks that are now built into set as well uh, from your phone. So there we go, there's our interpreter session and we can run whatever we want from there. Next one that I would normally do would be run cred collect and that's going to also get your domain tokens and things like that. So you can, again, do a, a, uh, a token impersonation uh, session uh, with your domain users and everything also from your phone. So uh, while that's running, I'll kind of skip back and go back to the actual slides here. So that was sweet, right? It was fun. <laughs> so. Um, Really, I mean, uh, th this type of thing, it, it, if these, whether it's using a remote control drone, whether it's deciding to have the expenditure of a jetpack to get over somebody's fence, or it's to use some, your phone um, to, to leverage the ability to take everyday items, they, it affects everybody's organization, their security policy procedure and things like that. But, uh, you know, having these outside 
um, ways of entry and, and ideas aren't your normal everyday things. So if uh, IT managers, if uh, support teams, things like that, don't actually take the time to go, well, could I do it? Fuck yeah, that was cool. Uh, when you actually get done, a lot of times this stuff doesn't, this, nobody ever thinks about actually doing it. So the, it goes back to really be having best practices to actually protect against this stuff. It's, a, it's all your normal, everyday, uh, you know, make sure that you have active monitoring, your IDS, IPS, stuff like that. Uh, security awareness is huge. If somebody sees a remote control or a, a miniature predator drone flying over a bu your building, you might want to alert somebody. Just a thought. Um, policy and procedure, obviously, if you don't have anything that, no, uh, that somebody knows how to do things or where to go or who to talk to, and uh, they, you have this stuff written, you pay thousands, organizations pay thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to have policies and procedures written to only sit on top of somebody's file cabinet, collect dust. If they're, if they're not enforced, if, not, if they're not uh, actually put out there and actually enacted, enabled, and known, then nobody's going to be able to follow them. Um, any, any rules are bad, you know, and uh, yes, WEP, don't use it, it's not recommended. Uh, if you're having a pen test done, especially, turn it off, because it's, it's, it's not going to benefit you, you in any way. Uh, so really, I mean, the, the goal of the presentation is really to have fun, it's, it's to open up an awareness for things that you might think fantasy, fantasy, you might think fiction, you might think uh, it's some kind of weird, cool movie idea, but a lot of stuff is really available out there. Um, you know, the ability to allow phones to walk wherever you are. I mean, if, if I went to work tomorrow and my organization said that I can't have my phone, I would probably figure out how to get it in. I need my Angry Birds at lunch. So uh, it, that's business necessity. That's, yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, having these uh, things able to just freely walk in and out without thinking about them uh, and some other context, then it's just a phone, it's just a toy, things like that. Nobody's ever going to th think about how to protect against the stuff, and the stuff walks in and out of everyone's organization every day. So uh, that's really, that's my spiel. I think I'm in time. Awesome. Fantastic. So yep, that's, that's everything. Um, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to hit me up on Twitter, uh, email. Uh, you can check out my site. All, this, all the stuff for the devices can be downloaded at my website. Everything's free. Um, there's two versions. If you want to go with the older one and you want to get a phone that you can actually discard if you need to uh, for like 60 bucks, there's a light version. And then there's a full version. The full version, you need an 8 gig uh, micro SD card for your phone. If you want the light one, you can do it on a four gig. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions or anything, feel free to hit me up at any time.